We are often asked, what is the best way to lay track? What is the best way to ballast track? And what is the best track? There's no simple answer, as there are many factors we need to consider before we lay our first piece of track, such as what do we hope to achieve? What level of skill do we have? And what can we afford to pay? We will be looking at a broad range of topics directly related to model railway track, hence the title, track laying, ballasting, plus much more. Now this wonderful photograph is a great place to start as it illustrates the topics of gauge and scale, two terms which are often misused and misunderstood. Gauge is simply the distance between the rails. There are many types of gauges used throughout the world, but the standard gauge is four foot eight and a half. Let's look at the origin of this seemingly odd size. Standard gauge refers to the distance between the tracks on the main and branch lines of railways in the UK. It's based on the early colliery tracks in the northeast of England and adopted by George Stevenson, one of the early railway pioneers. Standard gauge of four foot eight and a half is still the UK standard, except for Northern Ireland, where it's five foot three. Many of the world's railways continue to run on four foot eight and a half gauge due to being constructed by British engineers. Let's look at narrow gauge. Narrow gauge refers to any width of track less than standard gauge. It's typically seen in industrial applications, quarries and scenic areas throughout the UK. Narrow gauge has a number of advantages over standard gauge track. Due to its reduced size, the rolling stock is much lighter, smaller, and can go where standard gauge locomotives would be prohibited. Around the world, narrow gauge is used in difficult mountain environments, such as the Rockies of North America and South Africa. The loading gauge represents the maximum cross-section of rolling stock allowed on a particular line or system. Here we see the British, Continental and American gauges. You can see that they vary considerably. The UK loading gauge is one of the most restrictive in the world mainly due to the fact that we are still using infrastructure based on the 19th century. As a result, European trains are restricted to new channel tunnel routes. You may ask what the loading gauge has to do with model railways. Apart from authenticity, we need to ensure sufficient clearance at platform edges, trackside structures, and between adjacent lines. Let's look at the next of our topics, scale. Scale is the proportion of the model to its real life counterpart. In our track laying image, the scale is full size or one to one. 176 scale or double O or OO, is therefore 176th the physical size of real life. Let's take a look at Flying Scotsman and a double O model. If you look carefully at the dimensions, you'll probably see that models are not always exactly the scale. Let's take a closer look at double O scale. Double O scale is the most common scale that we use in the UK, and it's a development of European HO gauge 
going back to the 1930s. As you'll see from this splendid photograph of the Royal Scot, European and US locos are much larger than UK locos. European scale is 1 to 87. However, early electric motors would not fit into 187 scale UK locomotive. And so a compromise was reached of a scale of 176, but using HO track, presumably for commercial reasons. As a result, double O scale is not a true scale. And if you look at a double O scale locomotive from the front, you'll realize it does not look quite correct as the wheel sets appear to be too narrow. Here we have a direct comparison between double O and HO scale rolling stock. The coach on the left is double O. The coach on the right is HO. However, both are modeled on UK coaches of similar proportions. Both share the same track cage. Beware adverts that state double O HO compatible because invariably they are not. Now we will turn our attention to the model gauge. On the left, we have models based on standard gauge locos and on the right, models based on narrow gauge locos. There are numerous different gauges available to suit small layouts or right up to the garden layouts. The two most popular UK gauges are double O and N. You will see that double O shares the HO gauge, but we have a problem of scale as double O HO track tends to be modeled on 3.5 millimeter to the foot versus the four millimeter to the foot of double O. And so the sleeper spacing and dimensions are incorrect. We'll speak more of this later. Also note that 009 and narrow gauge shares the same gauge as N gauge. However, whereas British N scale is 1 to 148, 009 scale is 1 to 76, the same as 00 scale. And so 00 scale and 009 scale can be run on the same layout as we do with back and forth. Once again, we have a problem with scale. Although 009 locos will run on N gauge track, the scale is incorrect, significantly incorrect, and will look odd. 009 scale therefore has its own track available. With apologies to the non 00 users, we will continue with 00 only. However, most of the techniques are applicable to all but the largest of scales. Wheels are every bit as important as the track. So let's take a closer look at wheel sets. Here are some of the key wheel parameters we need to be aware of to avoid derailments. Back to back, tread width, and flange depth. Older rolling stock often has plastic or metal wheels which have wider treads and deeper flanges than are prototypical. This can cause problems with points or when we use code 75 track. 
It's advisable to change older wheel sets for new profile metal wheels where possible. New metal wheel sets are readily available and easily fitted to the vast majority of coaches and rolling stock. They will improve the running of the vehicles and reduce the drag on the locomotive. This has been covered in a previous presentation. Changing wheel sets on locomotives is a little more difficult due to the tight fit on the axles. However, this can also be achieved with the use of a wheel press, which again has been covered in a previous presentation. On the far right, you'll see a back-to-back -back gauge. This is used to check axle sets to ensure the correct spacing between the back of the wheels. This is essentially a piece of accurately machined brass and is available in most common gauges. We are getting closer to track laying, but without a plan, this will be a disaster. This topic has already been covered as a separate presentation. So we will just touch on the basics. This shows Hornby track and the well-established first, second and third circumference curves. Track sections are available to construct three concentric circles to enable safe running while maintaining a distance between the track centers. And for Hornby double O, this is 67 millimeters. We can produce reverse curves whilst maintaining the correct spacing between track. We can also use points that are designed to maintain the 67 millimeter spacing. This results in easy to use track plans, ensuring that even complex layouts can be constructed with complete confidence by a relative beginner. Rigid track is available in first, second and third radius curves. This enables a constant spacing between the tracks. Track gauges are available to maintain correct spacing during construction. These are especially useful when using flexi track. On the right hand side, you'll see various examples of Pico gauges used for this very purpose. On the left, you'll note the Pico six foot weigh gauge. So called because it's based on the six foot distance between parallel tracks laid in the UK. The gauge has two settings and the 50 millimeter setting is for Pico Streamline, which we'll cover shortly. This uses 50 millimeters between the track centers versus the 67 millimeters of Hornby 00. Prototypical accuracy must sometimes make way for practicality, as model railway curves tend to be much tighter than real life. We'll come back to this. Here we have two WASAG 3D printed track gauges, one in double O and one in N gauge. These are very inexpensive tools and very useful for setting the centers of double O and N gauge. We've looked at the first, second and third radius curves, and this is why they are important. First radius curves are only really suitable for small locos. Six couple locos may stall or derail. Second radius curves are suitable for most locos, but a bigger radius provides better running. When you purchase model locos, you will find on the box a recommendation as to which is the minimum track radius that are suitable for running on.
Let's take a look at the effect of radii on modern rolling stock. Long rolling stock will have a tendency to hang over first radius curves. And as a result of the, the tight curves, this can cause buffer lock and derailment. Modern express trains also look incorrect on tight curves. As you can see from the image, if longer rolling stock is used on tight curves, there is a possibility of colliding with rolling stock coming in the opposite direction. Here is a very useful and inexpensive WASAG 3D track scribe. It's fully adjustable and it enables you to scribe a line on the baseboard. It's very useful for setting up parallel tracks. Modeling inclines is an old favorite. And while inclines clearly add interest to a layout, there are some practicalities to consider. The maximum UK mainline gradient is one in 37. And this is to be found at the Licky incline near Birmingham. As a comparison, BTOC is one in 60 and SHAP is one in 75. A 1 in 30 gradient for double O scale needs a 30 inch run for each 1 inch rise, plus the transition to level grade at either end. And so a lot of space is required for even a moderate incline. We then run into the problem that most locals will struggle on a 1 in 30 grade with a heavy load. However, locos can be weighted to improve traction, or we can use DCC Concepts Power Base, both of which we'll look at shortly. The lower image illustrates the problem of the transition to the level grade. This must be a very gentle transition, and of course adds to the overall length of the incline. Curves should also be planned very carefully on your layout. Curves may cause a loss of traction when pulling heavy trains, particularly at low speeds, and therefore plan station approaches with care to avoid starting on curves. Once again, weighting locomotives can improve traction, as can the use of DCC Concepts power base. There are many different types of track to choose, but before we look at some of these, let's take a moment to compare N-Gage and 009 track. On the left-hand side, you'll see a section of N-Gage and 009. Both share the same gauge. N-Gage and 009 locomotives could theoretically run on either of them. However, when you compare the scale, you'll appreciate the problem. The N-gauge scale is considerably different to the 009, and therefore using the wrong scale would be inappropriate. There are a number of considerations that will determine the type of track that we choose. The physical size of our layout will determine the scale and the gauge that we select. We may be modeling in the 1920s, 40s, modern day. Therefore, we have to consider the period. Ultimately, we need to consider the cost. Ready-made track is available by Pico, Hornby, Backman, and others. You could choose to go down the handmade route, especially if you have a specific period that you wish to model and you wish to go for authenticity. Also consider, do you require wooden or concrete sleepers? Should the truck be rigid or flexible or both? You'll see that codes 175, 83, and 
fine scale are available. Take care when ordering to get the correct track. You could choose between live or insulated frog points. I'm using the Pico product catalog to illustrate the various different types of track available, simply because Pico produces a wide range of different track types to suit most layouts. However, Hornby and Backman also produce a considerable range of readily available track. Let's start by looking at code 100 rigid track. 100 refers to the track height, 0 0.1 of an inch. It's basic starter track, the sort of track that we will all be familiar with from the very first starter set we were given. It's rigid construction. It is, however, robust. The tracks are fitted together with joiners, sometimes called fish plates. It's very easy to use with track plans, such as the ones we've already discussed. Pico and Hornby 100 rigid track is compatible with one another. However, one downside of code 100 rigid track is that it's not prototypical. So if you are looking for authenticity, this is not the track for you. Pico also produce code 100 in Streamline. Once again, this has a track height of 0.1 of an inch. And so it's suitable for running mixed wheel flange sizes of up to around 1.6 millimeters. It's compatible with rigid track and other code 100 track. It's robust. Flexible track is available. This can be extremely useful, especially when designing your own layouts. There is a choice of point types. Again, it's not prototypical. Now we move on to code 75 streamline. And as the 75 suggests, the track height has been reduced to 0.075 of an inch. As a result of that, we have a track height which is a closer approximation to four millimeters to the foot, double O scale. It's more realistic than code 100. However, it is less robust than code 100. And we have possible problems with older rolling stock due to the deeper flanges, as we've mentioned before. It can be joined to code 100, but it is really not recommended to do so. And for completeness sake, we also have code 83 for those modeling American railroads. Let's take a close look at code 100 versus code 75. It is not advisable to mix the codes, but if you really must, there are special joiners available. The image on the left shows the disparity between the two rail heights and aesthetically, it looks very poor. The image on the right shows that different manufacturers may use different heights of sleeper with code 75. So again, be very careful when you're ordering track to ensure it matches what you already have. Fine scale is worth the presentation in its own right. And I hope that at some point, someone will be kind enough to oblige us. But in the meantime, here are a few points to bear in mind. Fine scale is a standard established in the 1950s to be as close as possible to prototypical dimensions as applied to track work and wheels. Several standards are encompassed within fine scale, such as EM, 
and P4, which are both four millimeter scales. And here we see a comparison of double O, EM, and P4. But note that 18.88 millimeters is the exact 176th of standard gauge. Track is available through specialist sites as are appropriate wheel sets for converting rolling stock. And Pico also produce code 75 in fine scale. While we're on the subject of authenticity and modeling a particular period, let's take a look at three rail profiles that you can find on the railways throughout the UK. First of all, we have the double-headed rail. Now, the double-headed rail was originally intended to be reversible as the initial track surface wore, then the rail could be turned over in the chairs. However, this was rarely done in practice, as by the time the initial surface had worn, the rest of the rail tended to be badly corroded. This led to the development of the bull-headed rail, which still finds some use today in specific applications and can be found on the London Underground. The flat bottom rail is, however, easier to manufacture and is most commonly used. You will find this used in the majority of ready-to-run model railway track. Points, turnouts, or switches. Use whichever name you wish, but there are many types of them, including, just to mention a few, small radius, express, curved, Y, slips, and crossings. Here are three of the common types. Available in code 100 and code 75. Small radius points may cause the derailment of larger locos and are not recommended unless your layout comprises of small locomotives. Use express or medium to large points if the space allows. And this will result in much easier running of your rolling stock. Curved points are also available, but they can also cause running problems. The outer curve is normally used as the through road. As some manufacturers, code 100 points may cause issues with newer locomotives and rolling stock with fine wheel sets. This is due to the design of the check rail sometimes known as the, the guardrail, and we will look at this in more detail. Here we have a generic image of a set of points. We have the well-known features, stock rails, points, which are the only movable section, guardrails, the frog, and the through and diverging routes. If we take a look at the guardrail, in the real world, guardrails are there to prevent the sideways movement of the wheel sets as they move through the gap between the sections. In the model world, the guardrail provides exactly the same function, and here lies the problem. Older designs of guardrails are much too wide to accommodate the fine wheel sets. Therefore, there will be sideways movement, which results in the wheel hitting the frog, therefore causing a derailment. It is possible to alleviate this problem 
by gluing very fine strips of modeling plastic to the inside of the guardrail. However, it's not advisable to use mixed wheel sets. By that, I mean the old style of wheel set versus the fine scale on the same layout. Let's look at the first of the different types of points that I mentioned. This is the Insul Frog, and it's manufactured by Pico. It's the most common that you will find, and it's the original type of point. As a result of that, it's compatible with the similar type of Hornby and Backman point. It has an insulated frog to avoid short circuits under certain conditions. And encircled, you'll see the frog area. Being made of plastic, the frog may cause contact issues with small tank locos due to the insulated sections. This type of point works with DCC without any modification. However, beware of older wide metal wheel sets causing shorts at the frog ends of the tracks. The second type of point is the electrofrog. Again, it's manufactured by Pico. And the intention is to provide superior electrical contact over insul frog. It achieves this by making the frog live by the movement of the point blade to maintain correct polarity. However, care must be taken in the track layout and the wiring to avoid short circuits. Insulated joiners must be used at the frog end in the diagram tracks B and C to avoid short circuits. There are numerous options for improving the performance further by adding additional wiring of points and stock rail. You can also find a previous presentation relating to automatic loops. Here is the Unifrog. Pico have designed the Unifrog to replace Insul Frog and Electrofrog. It's DC and DCC ready straight from the box. Let's take a look at some of the attributes of Unifrog. It's ready for DCC straight out of the box. There are no mechanical connections needed between the switch and the stock rails. It features dead or live frog operation. The switch rails do not change phase depending on the state of the frog. And so the switch rails are not self-isolating. Both routes out of the turnout are powered regardless of the frog mode in use or the position of the switch rails. The point rails are powered via wires beneath the turnout connecting the stock, closure and point rails. As a result of this, insulated rail joiners are not required on the point rails to prevent a short caused by power routing. This feature is built into the Unifrog construction. The frog is unpowered unless wired via a switch. It can be converted to live or dead frog without removal of the point by simply connecting or disconnecting the wire feeding the frog. Only the stock rails need to be connected to the power bus. And there are some disadvantages of the Unifrog design. The frog is dead unless it is powered. Also, there is no power routing, as in the insult frog, should you want to run analog, as the point rails are electrically connected to the stock rails. 
let us take a look at underlay. Underlay is not strictly necessary, but it can enhance a layout. Underlay performs a number of functions. Sound installation is particularly important if you have a large layout with a large number of tracks all running simultaneously. Run on a hard surface, the sound can be quite significant. Underlay can also be used to provide a defined track bed, as can be seen in the bottom left image. It can be used to level a track bed where you have an uneven baseboard, as can be seen in the center. It's a much easier surface to attach to than trying to attach track directly to what is usually a hard baseboard. Material can be foam, cork, MDF, or similar materials, but cork is the most common and economical. Cork is readily available in thin sheets, which are perfect for providing both an underlay and a defined track bed for double O. If a defined track bed is too high, for example, locomotive depots, shunting yards, then it's possible to lay a complete sheet of the insulation. Now we're going to take a look at cutting track, but hopefully not with one of these instruments. Let me start by issuing the first of a number of warnings. Use eye protection. Cutting track can be hazardous both to the person doing it and to those standing nearby. So take all necessary precautions. For this, we will use a suitable cutter or a mini disc. A mini drill with a cutting disc produces a clean cut on both sides of the track. Take care with positional accuracy and use a large enough disc so that it can remain vertical throughout the cut. Juron produce cutters specifically for track. There are two models, one for horizontal and one for vertical use. Use them only for cutting track. You'll also need a small file to clean up any burrs. Let's look at the complete job of cutting a section of track using cutters. Another warning, hobby knives, scalpel blades can break. Use eye protection and keep all other people well away. First of all, determine where to cut the track. Measure carefully, then measure carefully again, and when you're absolutely sure, lightly score the track. Use the cutters with the flat face towards the clean side of the track. Well, the reason is that the opposing side is beveled. Once the track has been cut, Remove sleepers carefully with a hobby knife and retain them. Finally, clean up any burrs with a fine file. Now that we have cut the track to size, we need to join it. Once again, the joiners are very sharp. Use eye protection. It's very easy to send joiners flying through the air at speed. Ensure there is no one around while you're working. 
Track is joined using track joiners, sometimes known as fish plates. They are available as either conducting or insulated. Insert a joiner to a prepared rail using fine nose pliers and leave approximately a 50% overlap. Then simply slide the next section of track into the joiners. Leave a slight gap between the tracks to allow for movement. Check carefully by sliding a finger across the joint that the rails have fully engaged. It's very easy to slide a joiner beneath the track rather than engage with it. So double check this before you secure the track. Carefully file down the joint if required. This may be the case if you are joining different manufacturers track and the sleepers have slightly different dimensions. Finally, remove the plastic chairs from the waist sleepers with a hobby knife and insert them in the gaps between the joined tracks. This technique is useful when you need to join rails across baseboard joints for movable sections. Position the rail across the join and mark points for the brass screws on the board. Cut the rails at the join, and here a cutting disc will ensure two clean surfaces, or if using a track cutter, the rough surface will need to be recut. Remove the appropriate number of sleepers from either track. Screw brass screws, solid, not plated, into the marked positions until they're just high enough to touch the underside of the rail. Solder the rails to the brass. And finally, make the electrical connections. Now we come to fixing the track. There are a number of different methods we can use. Firstly, we'll be looking at track pins. Use eye protection. Track pins can easily break and fly through the air. Keep others well away when you are working with track pins. Looking at some of the advantages of using track pins, they're very simple and they're very secure. However, there are also disadvantages. They are unsightly. They can distort sleepers. They can even result in an uneven or roller coaster type of track. Pins which are too wide in diameter can distort the sleepers. Fine track pins are available from model railway outlets. Do not be tempted to use whatever you happen to have in your toolbox. Rigid track is supplied with holes pre drilled in the sleepers periodically. But flexi track must have holes drilled in the sleepers using a fine drill. The technique is to position the track and hold a pin using fine pliers while gently tapping with a small hammer. Do not hammer the pin fully home. This will distort the sleepers. The aim should be to have a slight amount of vertical movement once the pin is home. Next, we'll look at fixing track using PVA adhesive. The advantages of using PVA is that when dry, it's invisible. It causes no damage to the sleepers. Track can be laid more evenly as the track is laid on a cushion of glue. Also, it can be lifted without too much difficulty if needed. 
There are disadvantages. It does take time to dry, possibly two to three days, depending on the environment. Some sections must be temporarily supported by pins while the PVA dries. The technique is simply to brush the PVA onto the track bed and position the track or brush PVA onto the sleepers and position the track. Finally, weight or pin the track loosely till it's dry. Let's look at fixing a straight section of flexi track. Cut the track to the correct length. Remove sleepers as required and attach the joiners. Keep the sleepers to fill the gaps between the completed tracks. Drill holes to accept track pins if required every three or so inches, including the end sleepers. Fix the track using pins or PVA. Track may be inserted between existing tracks by sliding the joiners fully onto the rails, inserting the track, and sliding the joiners back to close the joint. This can be very successful, but you need to ensure that the joiners are free to slide along the rails. Now we look at the technique for fixing flexi track when it's in a curve. The rails of flexi track are free to move in the sleepers and can be bent to the desired shape. Observe radii rules when creating curves. Mark out the desired curve on the baseboard, starting from a fixed section of track. Then Prepare the flexi track by drilling holes in the sleepers. Insert the flexi track into the fixed section and secure the first sleeper with a pin, but do not hammer it in completely. Gently form the curve and secure with pins as you go. As the curve forms, the outer rail will move in the sleepers. Use fine pliers to ease the rail back into the joiner of the fixed section. And keep doing this constantly. Continue this process until you have temporarily pinned the track throughout the entire length of the curve. Ensure the rails are still secured in the joiners. The inner rail will have to be cut to match the length of the outer rail. Do this with great care. Temporarily fixed pins allow for adjustment of the curve. When satisfied with the result, either carefully hammer home the pins or glue the track and remove the pins when the glue has cured. Here we have a 3D printed WASAG track clamp. Our clamps can be used instead of pins to temporarily hold the curve. Multiple clamps will enable fine adjustment of a significant length of curve. The more clamps, the better. Now, this method makes it possible to easily lift the track for gluing. The general technique is as previously described, but the joints are staggered to prevent the track from kinking. The problem we have with flexi track is that if it is joined on a curve, there is a tendency for the track to push outwards, thereby causing the track to kink. This technique involves removing a section of the rail as can be seen on the left hand side. On the right hand side 
the appropriate number of sleepers are removed and the appropriate section of rail removed on the opposite side. This means that the rail from the right-hand track can be inserted into the chairs of the left-hand track and the rail joints made at staggered points. This is a very useful technique for joining track on curves. Track may buckle in extreme heat, for example, in loft installations. It's important, therefore, to leave a small gap between the rails when they're joined. And better still, lay the track in warm rather than cold conditions. Now we'll come to track ballasting. But what is ballast? Well, in the real world, ballast is the material used to provide a stable and secure bed for the sleepers and rails. Ballast is an aggregate. It's mined from quarries throughout the country. Real ballast is therefore not of uniform color or size. In the model railway world, ballast is a key element for creating realism, and it can also be used to secure the track to the baseboard. Look at the track bed when you travel by rail. Research the type of ballast used for the period in which you are modeling. If you look at a cross section of ballasted track, you'll see it shows a sloping shoulder. It's possible to buy cork track underlay, which has this profile already formed. Let's look at what we need to do in preparation for ballasting. Prior to ballasting the track, ensure that all electrical connections have been made. Insulate track as required for correct operation of certain Merg kits or DC block sections. The choice of ballast is considerable. You could use homemade. It's perfectly okay to select a few rocks, different types of minerals, grind them down to a suitable scale, and then you have free homemade ballast. There are various manufacturers of ballast, including Woodland Scenics, Jarvis, DCC Concepts, vendors at model shows. Although Ballast is often advertised with a choice of scales such as N, double O, O. In the real world, there is no such thing as scale ballast. The largest pieces you'll see are about the size of a clenched fist, but then they go down to almost dust, as you'd expect. Same thing applies for modern railway ballast. Choose the largest suitable ballast for your layout, but then add some smaller scale ballast just to add that touch of realism. There are various choices of color to choose from. There is also a choice of the quantity of ballast that you can buy, but bear in mind that ballast is heavy by its nature and therefore postal charges can be significant. Here we see examples of different scales of ballast and different colors. It's often a good idea to mix certain colors together to vary the color around your layout. 
When it comes to spreading ballast, there are different techniques that you can employ. Ballast can be spread using a spoon and leveled with a paintbrush or applied using various different types of ballast spreader. Personally, I prefer the spoon and the paintbrush. Whichever technique you use, carefully clean ballast from the points. This is not a job that you should rush at. Take it very carefully, section at a time, you'll be rewarded by the visual impact of a carefully executed job. Pay great attention to ensure that you clean ballast away from the insides of the rails. Otherwise, once the ballast is glued, then you'll have a problem with the inside of the wheel flanges connecting with the ballast and causing poor running. Having laid the ballast, now let's look at fixing it. We can use PVA. It's cheap, but it's messy and it takes time to dry. Again, two to three days, depending on the environment. We can use dry powder adhesive, such as Ballast Magic. It's expensive for large areas, but less messy than PVA and it can be reworked. You can use a proprietary glue, such as Ballast Bond. Again, this is expensive for large areas, but it's only used on small areas to avoid damage to surroundings, such as point areas. Let's look at fixing ballast with PVA. Dilute PVA is the traditional method of fixing ballast. Dilute the PVA with water approximately one to three, but of course this depends on the original viscosity of the PVA. So this can be largely trial and error, but we want a thinner rather than a thicker mixture. Add a few drops of washing up liquid. This is to break the surface tension and enable the liquid to penetrate deep into the ballast. Apply with a sprayer, but take care to avoid too much overspray. Soak the ballast well, especially if you're using the ballast to fix the track at the same time. Allow several days to dry. Don't be tempted to go back before it's dry. Otherwise, you'll have to start from scratch. Be sure to clean the spray bottles immediately after use. This image comes from a professional video from a company that sells ballast. It does illustrate that ballast should be well soaked. However, it's a bit liberal with the spray and the ballast shoulder is far too wide. Let's take a look at fixing ballast using dry powder. Deluxe Materials produces Ballast Magic. It's a dry powder that is mixed with the ballast prior to the spreading. The advantage of a PVA is that it is activated using water only and it cures much faster. The ballast can also easily be removed with a sponge and warm water. Here we have typical quantities of the powder being mixed with the ballast. It must be mixed very, very thoroughly for it to work correctly. Each grain needs to be coated. So thorough mixing is essential. 
Once it's mixed, then it's just a matter of laying the ballast with your preferred method. And here we see a very simple manual method finished off with a paintbrush. Once you're happy with the ballast, then it just needs spraying with water to activate the powder. This is the ballast fixing adhesive. It's Deluxe Materials Ballast Bond. It's a low viscosity liquid adhesive designed for ballasting small areas without the need for a spray. Potential uses would be fixing ballast around point working or when reworking small sections. And this is how it's applied. Very sparingly, very small areas. Wheel slip is something that is very common to real life steam locomotives. It can be disastrous. While wheel slip is not usually disastrous on a model layout, it can just simply mean that our train is not going anywhere. So how do we combat it? Weighting the locomotive is a tried and tested method. And lead shot was traditionally used for adding weight to the rolling stock. Deluxe Materials liquid gravity as a non-toxic substitute. Locomotives and rolling stock can benefit from some added weight. However, this may not be enough. Let's turn to DCC Concepts Powerbase. This product improves the adhesion of any locomotive, enabling locos to pull greater loads, up gradients, or around bends. Small, powerful magnets are attached to the chassis of the locomotive, and thin steel strips are attached beneath appropriate sections of the track. This is taken from a promotional video. And as you can see, the steel strips are positioned on some of the preformed ballast that we mentioned before. Although holes are being prepared to pin the steel strips to the baseboard, I found that simply gluing the steel strips to the baseboard is perfectly adequate. You'll note that the shape of the steel strips allows them to be easily maneuvered to form any curve that you require. After the steel strips have been secured, the track is then glued, placed in position and weighted until it's dry. Let's now look at a couple of videos showing a locomotive ascending a 1 in 30 gradient. Let's take a look at the same loco, but this time after power base has been added.
As you can see, a much happier Princess Coronation class. I can testify that this does work. I've used it extensively on my own layout for both inclines and curves, and it looks equally impressive seeing a long freight locomotive slogging its way up a gradient. If we take a look at railway track in the real world, we'll notice that no two lengths of tracks are the same. We see weather-beaten track with weeds and vegetation growing through it alongside the line. We see concrete sleepers. We see aged wooden sleepers, oil on the track, especially where locomotives have been standing. We can see freshly ballasted track, ballast which may be of a completely different color. The point is, in the real world, there is no such thing as consistently colored track. It is weathered. We can do the same. There are many different products to aid us in weathering the track. The finishing touches add realism to both the rail and the track bed. Try and observe real track and track bed when possible, but of course, safely. Look at the oil stains where locos frequently stop. Black acrylic paint with a dropper can replicate those. The rust on the rails. There are track painting pens that can simulate rust on the rails. General ballast grime can be replicated by using various aerosols. But if you're using an aerosol, wear a mask and ensure that the area is well ventilated. The cess, which is the area between the track and the adjacent land, often has weeds growing, even bits of rubbish. It is possible to buy scale rubbish to throw around the track. But as someone pointed out, if rubbish next to the track gives you a problem in real life, why add it to your own layout? Having laid our track and ensuring that our rolling stock are running perfectly, we need to keep it that way. As in the real world, we need to provide track maintenance. Track maintenance has also been covered in a previous presentation. So we will just briefly look at some of the techniques available to us. Needless to say, good track quality is essential for good running. Use a track rubber for heavy deposits. But having done so, clean away any debris that has been left. Use a proprietary track cleaner to clean and protect the rails. Consider a mobile track cleaner if you have a large layout. Don't forget to clean the loco and the rolling stock wheels. Well, this is a relatively new addition, certainly for Warsak. It's called No Ox ID. It's an electrically conductive grease. It is applied sparingly, very sparingly to tracks and long-term protection from corrosion and arcing is claimed. It's currently under evaluation by WASAG. We have a, a number of members who have treated their tracks. As you can see from this particular order, uh, I purchased a tub of the aforementioned uh, grease, and we'll all report back after a period of time. 
I've used many references throughout this presentation. These are just a few of them. Pico, Hornby, Modero Magazine, Woodland Cynics, BCC Concepts, DCWiki.com, numerous examples from the internet. And that is what I would encourage you to do. If there's a particular topic that you're interested in, just go into the, the internet, search for it, and there'll be a wealth of knowledge available. I hope that there has been something, no matter how small, during this presentation that's been of some help to all of you. And I sincerely hope that your efforts of track laying turn out a little bit better than these gentlemen. <laughs>